we have some of the people some of the people who are say preeminent in the field you could say uh, Annika Jurval Yurval Okerberry from Civil Rights Defenders uh, she's also the author of say one of the best known books concerning disability rights in Swedish um, and Civil Rights Defenders was mentioned in the article we wrote the other day as one of the uh, public interest law firms that you could, or uh, one of the firms that's developing the idea of a public interest law firm, and maybe we'll hear about some cases they're they're taking. And we have Suzanne Berry, policy director at Steel, a well-known activist, troublemaker. Uh, she's the one who's sitting up here, who's not a lawyer, uh, but who tends to ask. Uh, problematic legal question. I don't know why. Uh, and then Andrea Bundeson, she's a lawyer working at the HSO's uh, uh, Our Sister Projects, we say, uh, ca called from Talk to Action. And they're taking, they're also taking some cases, or there's a case going on right now that might be of interest. The idea was that they would reflect a little bit on what they've heard today, then uh, ask questions to Pat and Sid, and then we'll open up the floor to more questions. That's the plan. Suzanne? You, you get start since you're closest. Should have sat at the other end. Uh, um, <laughs> I think my, my overall sense of this is that we have some major problem with the Swedish, the way both we, the law is um, written in Sweden and of course how we, how we use it, but also because that means that we have to really strategically think about how we can use the existent law here because there were things that I heard that I thought was very uh, attractive, like, for example, this possibility to sue for uh, e e equitable outcome. Is that the right uh, terminology? Which I think um, would be much better in a way, because we have a problem in Sweden where the Swedish legislation, yes, the, it first of all, it pushes you into a reconciliation process. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as the, the, the end outcome of the reconciliation also is, is educate, it has an educationary um, perspective for the, for, for the outside world. It's not just a compensationary thing for the individual. But when it, it moves on to the, the legislation itself and it becomes a, a case, uh, the damages can only be, be for individual compensation and the, the sums are very low. So we have a problem in finding a way of using it so that we get this pedagogical effect uh, that discrimination is wrong. That's one of the things I, I thought about. I also uh, thought that was quite interesting to hear uh, uh, how you went about fundraising because I think uh, and also within that how to find cases I think also Sid uh, was talking about how measures to find cases because I think uh, that's two of the main issues we need to address is first how to get money uh, to actually uh, be independent and and we in Sweden tend to think that you're independent if you get money from the government um, and not from Starbucks, um, mm. which isn't really, really true. You could probably uh, have more independence from Starbucks than you have from the government, depending on how you um, phrase the, the, the agreement. Uh, but when we need to find money, but we also have a problem with finding cases. And, and I thought the idea of of, of first of, of speeches at uh, disability organizations, an event where disabled people are, and, and also the fact that choosing really what I would call bread and butter issues to push cases for was one of the things. There's a lot of things going on in my head. I think I'll just stop there. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah, no, I, don't, I don't really know what to say now, but <laughs> yeah, first of all, I think it's very interesting to hear how you have been working with various cases. Uh, it gives us inspiration um, and show us that it is possible. And I also think it's so important that we start to use the law as tools. And um, perhaps I should mention just a couple of words about civil rights defenders. It's an organization working mainly with civil and political rights. And my area of work are the rights um, and the situation of persons who have been deprived their freedom of liberty. Um, people within, within the pre-trial detention, in prisons, migrant uh, detention of migrants, but also the various forms of compulsory care. And I must say that there are so many, there are so many violations in Sweden. I never, ever, ever thought it is that bad as it is. So here, uh, right now, I have four cases um, uh, which I'm working on. Uh, and all these cases are typical cases uh, symbolizing structural problems um, in Sweden. Um, so I, I've, and we have just started working with them, so I don't know the result. Then, but uh, I'm really, it was interesting to hear you today here. You tell us that it works and they give us a lot of new energy. I don't know if I'll talk about the cases now or later on. Perhaps I should pass to you before and then continue later. <laughs> I felt so inspired. I was practically jumping up and down in my chair while listening to you. Uh, this is an area I think that we in Sweden need to really work to develop. Uh, we have quite a lot of legislation. Um, it is quite, uh, some of it is quite good actually. Uh, the statue itself may be good and adequate, but what we see now, uh, and which is a big concern, is that Swedish courts, Swedish authorities, are actually downgrading the law. They're downgrading rights that we have already achieved here and diluting the purpose of legislation and here i think it's important that we work together and uh, mobilize the movement the disability movement to bring more cases to court uh, that do this uh, and i will also say something about from talk to action it's the sister project of uh, your project and we want to try to implement the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities better. And one of the aims by which we try to achieve this is to bring cases to court. We do this with our member organizations and outside support. And, and we, we uh, see this as an important tool. Do you have any specific questions for Pat or Sid? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, the cases you described that you've been taking, you've taken so many. Um, and I imagine that the uh, volume is important. But And you say that you have won 396 out of 400 cases. <laughs> And I wonder what, or successfully settled, or I wonder, but what are the most important things to think about when bringing a case to court? Okay, I'm not sure I heard that. Mm -hmm. I'm hard of hearing. Uh, what are the most important things to consider wh when taking a case to court, do you think? Yeah. What are the factors that we consider in deciding which cases yes. to take? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it keeps me up at night, actually. Um, uh, our number one factor um, is impact. How many people does it impact 
in a very real way what's going to work. so so if you look at the cases I described um, when you're talking about um, health care or you're talking about um, the ability to move around the city or in the case of the veterans you're talking about life and death um, yeah, every one of those cases um, is one that's impact. Um, you know, sometimes um, the same amount of effort can impact one person or it can impact <laughs> a thousand people. So that's, that's one that we look at. Um, the second that we look at is um, in our own resources, how efficient and effective can we be? Um, so some fights, unfortunately, um, are so uphill and so difficult and would take such a long time, it's, you know, we decide it's not worth our resources. Um, to be honest, I have to say, we're also partially driven by the desires of the lawyers within the firm. You and I were talking um, at the break, and we have a couple of lawyers in wheelchairs, we have a couple of lawyers who are, are blind, um, well, the lawyers in wheelchairs like the access cases, and um, uh, the two lawyers that we have who are blind really like access to technology, as you can imagine. So that's all, it all goes into the mix. Um, uh, I think the most, single most important thing is what does the disability community want and take as its priorities? Annika, you described that you said that you have a couple of cases going. Maybe you could describe one and say, say, explain why did you choose that case? Well, I think I described two of them because they are the, they are so different and, and we are dealing with them in different ways. Well, uh, one of the cases um, concerns. Um, um, persons, um, in this case, yes, one person, but uh, it, it sh it's a very typical case. Uh, and it's a person um, within the forensic psychiatric care. Um, and the doctor has said that he is ready to be discharged. And it was two years ago. So this means he is still locked up without any support in law. And if you're taking a look at the yearly report from the National Quality Register, you can see that today 13% of people who are deprived of freedom and liberty within the forensic psychiatric care is um, ready to be discharged. So it's quite many. And these figures are increasing. So what we're doing now is that we will take this, court, uh, this uh, case, his case, to the Council of U um, Justicia. And if uh, we win, we will use it as a precedent um, and help others to complain and also show that it will cost for the regional and the local authorities to violate human rights. And I must say the reasons for why they are still locked up is shortcomings between um, or within the local and regional authorities, but also uh, shortcomings in the cooperation between them. Um, if we lose, uh, we will go to the Court of Europe um, of Human Rights um, and ask them to see if there is a violation of human rights. And if we went there, uh, the European Court of Europe um, will hopefully ask Sweden to change the, what is the problem. And another case um, concerns um, this proportional uh, force by the policeman towards people with psychosocial disabilities. And here we have a terrible case, which is just one of many. And as Mr. Sintu, uh, I got the permission from his family to, to use his name. So, uh, But um, he was, one day he became quite strange, and his friends drove him to the um, compulsory psychiatric care in Westeros. And a couple of days later on, he became very outreacting. Uh, and he started to run in the corridors and, and, uh, and so on. And the nurses tried to calm him down. But in the meantime, they were calling the police. And when the police arrives, um, the man seemed to was uh, inside the room. He was alone and he was calmed down. Even though five policemen runs into the room, they push him towards the wall and down to the floor. They use three bars, three bars of pepper spray. He just wanted to 
pressure is it hurt very much, but they used three bars. And they also put um, a knee behind his shoulders, which not is allowed uh, according to Swedish law. And they also put a plastic bag over his mouth. So there are so many things that the policemen did, um, even if they're not allowed to do it. And what we also know is that um, last year there was a poll from um, the police union in which Three or four policemen says they don't have adequate knowledge to deal with people with psychosocial problems. So what we are complaining on is um, that there is a lack um, of knowledge among the police. There is also lack of routines and there is also lack of um, support to the police and um, guiding um, support in the actual situation. Um, what we do here is that we go to court to complain um, on what has happened. Uh, but we are also using the media. Uh, so next week, for instance, we will meet Daniel Velasco, which is one of the, he had made a lot of um, documents on, on this, to highlight this problem in, in, uh, among the police. And in um, February, we will also arrange um, a seminar within the parliament um, to discuss how can we have a change on this, because we also have very old fashioned legislation when it comes to people with psychosocial disabilities and um, when the police is um, allowed to use force and arms. So I think part from just litigation is also important to use the media and, and to act in many ways to, to have a change. So thank, thank you. Sid, any reactions? Has your firm dealt with this kind of these kinds no, of cases? Have, um, other firms have, but we okay. We have not done cases. We have not done cases like that. Um, we have done cases um, on behalf of um, young people with disabilities in jails, in incarcer incarcerated, um, and one of our um, uh, biggest cases was. Um, where they were keeping, uh, and police are terrible on questions of disability, and um, in the juvenile facilities, essentially um, jails or prisons, um, when they um, somebody with ADHD or um, some other disability would act out, they put them in solitary confinement, um, which of course made everything much, much worse. And um, we had a case which essentially bans the use of solitary confinement um, by uh, prison officials for anybody with a disability. But we haven't done the kind of cases that you have. The, in the United States, um, the American Civil Liberties Union has done a number of those cases and has emphasized the importance of training for police people. I have a question. Um, one of the um, problems, but not what the issues of finding cases is that when you go out and ask people to report in, you get a very, um, you, you don't necessarily get the cases that are uh, cases you can uh, describe as discrimination according to Swedish law. Uh, and you also of very often get. Um, and a not so uh, full description of what actually happened, which means it is very hard to make uh, a choice, and it, it the choice in itself involves making quite a lot of work to get the information, to actually have information to make a choice between different cases. And you seem to have um, probably worked around this, and, and I wonder if you would have some um, advice or, or tools for how to deal with things like that. I understand that problem completely. And when we, 24 years ago, opened our doors, um, we had a very serious problem, just as you described. Um, people would call in, people would come in, um, it's very hard to sort out um, 
even sometimes they think it was a disability problem it was not a dis not a disability problem or not something we had expertise in and our answer to it was as i am kind of alluded to in my in my main remarks our answer to it was essentially we do not um, take cases that come into the door um, we deal with the disability organizations and we go to them and say what patterns have you seen um, what where where have you gotten 12 or 15 complaints and not just one and we're very upfront with the individuals we say um, we don't have the capacity or the resources to deal with what might be a hundred people a week um, and so we work directly with the disability organizations and deal with them um, <clears throat> otherwise it just gets overwhelming Jamie Bowling and not Swedish. Now I was thinking, but it's not really an issue today, but still I wonder what you would think, Sid, even though the states really hasn't come so far with the ratification of the convention, well, how are we going to be able to use the convention here in Europe where most of the, all but one of the EU countries have, have ratified? Is there any thoughts there? I'm just throwing it out. I think that's, um, that, that's an area that um, I actually don't know very much about. Um, uh, somebody, I think, mentioned the fact that um, a couple of years after we started DRA, we opened a small um, branch office in Budapest. Um, and um, um, at that time, we were doing a lot of work internationally. Um, but uh, United States courts don't pay much attention uh, to international conventions and uh, because uh, the ADA and these other statutes are so strong um, it, we just don't deal with it very much in the United States. I, I had a question for you. You mentioned the ACLU before. You have the uh, you have your organization. We know about uh, the Disability Rights and Education Defense Fund. There's the disability organization in Los Angeles or that connects a number of law schools. One question would be, how important is the, qu is the connection to law schools oh, in the US, it. law clinics and things like that? The, the other question would be, uh, how important has it been, say, for you as a lawyer, having the ACLU, having, say, different kinds of organizations that have been working on civil civil rights for a long time. Well, our NAACP, et cetera, okay. giving a framework to what you okay. do. Well, that's about five questions, and they're all good questions. All right. Um, I think the most interesting one is the connection to law school, and that's actually something uh, uh, we were talking about a little bit, but we have not talked about very much, and it's very, very important. Um, Part of the development of the disability rights movement in the United States has been um, the development of disability courses in law school um, and, and, and teaching students, not necessarily disabled students, teaching students about disability law as a field they might want to practice in. Um, and, and there are a number of law schools now um, including some of the top-ranking law schools um, in the United States teach disability rights law and it gets people really interested. The other piece of this, which is of the most extraordinary importance, is to get students with disabilities into law school um, and, and to actually talk to undergraduates um, and to get them um, interested in the practice of law. Um, there's no reason why even students with the most serious disabilities cannot be effective lawyers. I, I mean, I've, I've uh, mentioned the fact that we had a lawyer who graduated from Harvard Law School who's deaf and blind um, and um, was very effective. 
um, and um, um, actually we have a wonderful picture on our <laughs> website showing her on the 25th anniversary of the ADA face-to-face um, uh, -face with President Obama because um, she was invited to come to the White House um, for that special occasion. Um, the other piece of this is that we have clinical programs in disability law and that's um, one of the ways um, you can deal with the problem of um, uh, to some extent of financing and so I was at Disability Rights Education Defense Fund and I started um, um, as I, I had a position as a professor at law school supervising a group of students bringing lawsuits right? and so that was a way of um, paying my salary um, bringing lawsuits um, without any outside funding and at the same time training um, law students. And, and what about the ACLU? And the, the reason I ask that is there is no ACLU here. There is no... What is ACLU? It's the American Civil Liberties Union. Yeah. Um, and, and there's basically very few progressive, there are progressive lawyers, but there are very few progressive lawyers associations. Yeah, they've not been a major player. Okay. Um, they've been helpful. Um, they bring every kind, the American Civil Liberties Union brings all kinds of civil rights suits and some of the lawyers have brought some disability rights suits and they've been very, very important suits. They've been very helpful, but they only bring a few cases, um, and so they've just not been a major player. I should add, because I get sometimes asked this question, those of us who do disability rights law um, really cooperate. All the firms, even if they do a little bit, all the firms cooperate with each other. Um, we send each other briefs. We try to tell each other um, what, we're, what we're doing. If we're in town and it's a, out of town, we stop in and you know talk to the lawyers, and there's a good degree of cooperation. Mm -hmm. There's a question. Wait. Uh, only only one technical question. When you started this up and uh, lack of funding and so on, as a lawyer, were, uh, did you have an an insurance for your own mistakes uh, in relationship to your client? I mean, did we have malpractice insurance? Yes. Yes, and it's it's uh, is it's, it not very, it's not very expensive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because I think but, in, but in, in Sweden it's a little bit costly. Well, uh, uh, to yeah. be honest, to be honest, for the first year, don't tell anybody we didn't have any insurance. Okay. <laughs> okay. I I didn't have a salary, and we didn't have any insurance. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a question about the political situation in uh, the United States right now, actually. Because uh, in Sweden, uh, for the last couple of years, we have seen that the governments have been less and less interested in human rights and civil rights. They all always have been less interested, but, but even more so the last years. And uh, many of us are very afraid of what is now happening in the States because of the, uh, the when the, after the, uh, Donald Trump has uh, won the election. Uh, what do you think? Have you discussed what, what, what will happen with the laws uh, uh, that are protecting the human rights and civil rights in, in the, the States? For example, for example, the ADA law and so on. Is, is there under, under attack because of uh, the political situation or is it just something that will move uh, fly o uh, uh, move over uh, so uh, the impact of, of uh, this election will not be such such a great thing or uh, do you think uh, that that the civil uh, rights and human rights are under attack right now in, in the states well sad to say, and I think Pat agrees with me, um, uh, the United States in this last election has not only taken a turn to the right, um, it's taken a turn against civil rights. 
um, and it also um, um, uh, represents a philosophy of less government, which means less protection. Um, we've had many, many soul-searching discussions in the short period of time since the American election, um, and I think um, I think the first week was one of shock, dismay, despair, and what is happening now is um, that is turning into um, a resolve to um, to take up the cause, to recognize that um, uh, progress is not linear, it's a ebb and a flow, which now taken a turn one way and it makes our efforts um, even more important. Um, there are some very specific things in this election that are not good for uh, people with disabilities. Um, uh, Trump has just said he's appointing uh, Secretary of Education, a woman um, who is not favorable to public schools, um, but likes charter schools where disabled children have not done well. Um, he said he wants to cut the budget to the federal um, uh, Department of Education, and that has many programs that benefit um, children with disabilities. Could you so, explain what charter schools are? Um, so. Charter schools are not public schools. They're essentially privatized schools, and they work terrifically well in the well-to-do suburbs and not so well um, otherwise. One of the strategies that we're starting to talk about, which is something that I hope you will consider, is at the very beginning of my remarks, I talked about how there are local laws, like there's the New York City Human Rights Law and there's California uh, Disabled Persons Act. So one of the things we're talking about in the United States is, okay, things are not the way we like them at the federal level, let's work more at the state level. Well, let's work with state law. Um, so um, uh, let's, in a place like Berkeley or San Francisco, um, which are progressive areas, we can actually move ahead, not just be defensive. We can move ahead on rights for people with disabilities at the local level. And so when you talk about gaps in your in your national law, um, I hope you'll also consider whether you can do something in, in, in local ordinances or city ordinances or things of that nature. Things are not good, but it ain't over. <laughs> if I may, just one more comment to respond to you. Um, since Donald Trump is the president-elect, there has been a record number of donations made to these civil liberties organizations. People, without being asked, know that that's the only way is to just pump money into the organizations that are going to fight for the people who are most at risk during this uh, regime we're about to see start. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question, and uh, sorry, it will be m uh, maybe simplified because of my uh, my knowledge uh, of English. Uh, so uh, I, I assume that it's quite easy to prove that uh, some specific disability law is not respected, and uh, I would like to to ask uh, about your opinion or experience about uh, with the generic laws. Uh, laws for all citizens and uh, bringing uh, disability rights or uh, proving disability rights uh, uh, within uh, according those uh, generic laws. You know, uh, we we are talking about specific disability specific laws, and it's kind of, let's say exclusion of disability issues for uh, from a general uh, law system and i, I uh, th there is issue uh, about uh, either to include disability into the general law systems or uh, or create uh, specific laws uh, for for 
uh, the disability issues. So I would like really know, uh, really uh, hear about your experience, how to prove that some uh, gen uh, some rights which are uh, uh, for which are entitled all citizens uh, can be uh, uh, proved that they are not uh, respect for citizens with disability. Thank you. Okay, I, I think the answer is you need both, and in the United States we have both kinds of laws. So, um, for example, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is absolutely necessary because the generic general laws against anti against um, discrimination don't cover specifics like access to the subways um, um, or fixing the sidewalks or very specific things that are in the ADA. On the other hand, um, I mentioned to you um, this wonderful statute called the New York City Human Rights Law. Well, that is not a disability law. It's, it's just what it says. It's a human rights law, and it prohibits discrimination on the basis of, of, of gender, ethnic background, religious, and, and, you know, and all of the various disabilities. And, and then it mentions disability as one of them. All right. One of the things I really would like to emphasize for Sweden is, from the American experience, is the the Americans with the, the most important acts for people with disabilities, which are the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act that applies to government agencies, and the Americans with Disabilities Act did not come out of some long tradition in the United States of litigation or, um, or anything of that nature. It came out of the disability rights movement. So as many of you may know, the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act um, was just a, it was a law, but nobody was enforcing it until the disability rights movement did these massive sit-ins. I mean, and it wasn't other groups helping them, and it wasn't, it was people with disabilities, people in wheelchairs and people with sensory disabilities doing sit-ins at government offices. The Americans with Disabilities Act did not come out of a tradition of American litigation. Yes, we are a litigious society, all right? It also came out of the, 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 a moment in time when the disability community all parts of the disability coalesced around, we need this act. We need equitable enforcement. We need class actions. We need fee shifting. So it's still possible, but it, it isn't going to come from the lawyers. It's got to come from the disability community. I, I just thought I should add about this Section 504, uh, the Re Rehabilitation Act, which is mentioned up here. One of the key issues in that is that what, basically what I, the way I remember it or the way I understood it is it says that public money, federal monies, shall not go to private organizations that discriminate. It's a very clear message in regards to everybody getting our tax monies. And that was, say, one of the keys as to why that 1973 Rehabilitation Act was so important. Uh, it's an idea that uh, is slowly being established in Sweden, but it's something that people are very much afraid of. And I think one of the reasons they're afraid of it is it might work. <laughs> it puts those who want our tax monies on notice that they better perform to a higher standard, the standard that ensures delivering <laughs> services to everybody. Otto. I just might want to add here that as part of the outcome of this Section 504, and Sid, you might correct me, we have had, it has had great impact on public procurement. So when we have in our windows operative system sticky keys, for example, or we don't have to put push two keys at the same time, 
that can do one after another. This is not just that uh, Microsoft had this fantastic idea. They were bloody well forced to do these changes to the operative system and many others as part of the accommodation process. So we benefit even here because it would be too expensive to for Microsoft to have different uh, operative system, one for the US and one for Europe. So we all benefited from this, uh, writing piggyback. But uh, see, I want to come back to an earlier comment you made in response to a question you said, we don't take any cases through the door, coming in through the door. You take cases that have been filtered through the organizations of disabled people. But that raises the question, do those organizations have the resources to filter these, process them, weed out those that don't, and take out the strategic ones? Do they have the resources? How do they do this? Well, we try to work with the organizations that are most effective. Um, and, and the short answer is uh, the organizations that we work with do have the resources at, at, at to, to deal with complaints, to sort out the complaints, to try to figure out strategies. And sometimes they're focusing on a specific disability and sometimes they focus on many disabilities. So we work with National Federation of the Blind um, in the United States, and those organizations, of course, focus on issues having to do with the blind, but they have many chapters around the United States. Um, we work with the Hearing Loss Association of America. They're a major client, and they have chapters around the United States. We work with the major independent living centers, all right? So, um, for example, just to give you an example, um, the, the disaster planning case against New York City, that grew out of us going around um, on a given week. We spent the whole week going from one independent living center to the other, and we kept hearing, we're really worried because the hurricane season is coming, and we've looked at the plans, and we've gotten complaints. Um, people don't know what to do um, when if disaster strikes. Well, we heard it from Brooklyn Center for Independent Living. Then we heard it from Staten Island Center for Independent Living, and we said, hmm, maybe we better look a little closer. And that, that's, that's the way the, the cases come to us. Um, when we started, we dealt with anybody who went in the door, and we decided it wasn't just we weren't using our resources right, we were not doing them a favor, because uh, basically we heard their story, but we, we couldn't do anything about it. So working with the, the disability organizations is, in, in my view, really the way to go. Where? May I, in the meantime? Yes, yes. please do. <laughs> um, uh, I think that we need to take more cases uh, than we do now. Um, and I was really intrigued by your uh, idea of having law schools, uh, uh, having programs doing this. And I would like to inquire, how did you go about realizing that, that uh, program? That's a good question. I <laughs> hadn't thought of it before. Um, the way it actually happened is um, um, when I got out of law school in 1932, no, I'm kidding. Um, when I got out of law school, other than the civil rights movement, there was no public interest firms. There were no NGO law firms. There was no, not only was there no disability rights, there was no children's rights, there was no women's rights, there were no gay and lesbian rights, there were no environmental rights. 
And so, believe it or not, I went with a Beverly Hills entertainment industry law firm <laughs> right, um, to try to at least be a trial lawyer. All right? And uh, five years later, two days after they made, they made me a partner, I quit. Right? And then I was lucky enough to get a job um, running the first um, um, legal aid, legal service program for San Francisco. <laughs> but I had to take such a pay cut, right, <laughs> that I went over and I did part-time teaching at University of California, Berkeley, <coughs> so I could feed my family. I've got three kids, <laughs> right? Um, and while I was there, um, and starting then to do disability rights well before the ADA um, came into effect, uh, the dean asked if, he said, well, this looks like interesting disability and elder law. Um, maybe you'd like to uh, do a clinic, all right? And we started doing a clinic. The same thing happened at Paul's Law School. Um, just, you know, great minds think of the same thing. Um, at Loyola Law School in Southern California, um, uh, they decided they would. They had done a disability. They had done a clinical program in criminal law. They had done a disability. They had done a, a clinical program in, in other kinds of civil rights. They decided to try disability rights, and the idea has now spread. It's in many, many law schools around the country. We have a question. We, w we would just like to comment uh, on this one. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I believe that this is a really good idea for Sweden because uh, the Swedish law schools, uh, or at least where I went, had really little practical experience. So I believe that the interest would be quite big from students uh, to participate in si such clinical programs. And it would be an excellent way to spread knowledge and uh, perhaps um, bring in those students with disabilities wanting to go to law school and participate in. Okay, yes. In fact, uh, Civil Rights Defenders just started um, uh, the first clinic uh, in human rights um, at the Uppsala University this autumn. Um, and if um, what we have to utvärdera. Evaluate, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we have to evaluate it, but if it works fine, we will try to, to cooperate with other universities and law schools in Sweden as well. Mm -hmm. So there are examples. So. Okay. Um, my, I, I have actually two questions. The, the first one would be, um, are you, are you, uh, is your law firm engaging in trying to initiate judicial review on the law and executive decisions and like how, how you go about that if you do so and also I was wondering whether you are engaging in in uh, in the enforcement of criminal laws such as like for example I don't know hate crime and or or even corporate crime thank you um, the answer is no, we've not been doing that. Um, uh, the, the extent to which we um, have brought litigation against corporations have all been in the discrimination, uh, purely in the discrimination area. I, I mean, I should say probably 50% of our cases are against corporations and 50% of our cases are against government bureaucracies, and the latter is one of the reasons why government enforcement is not enough. It's hard to get a government agency to sue another government agency. Um, you know, they all go to the same seminars. <laughs> um, um, and um, uh, uh, so basically, we have n the, the only way we have gotten into uh, that area at all is what I mentioned before, which is juvenile justice and uh, dealing with people with disabilities in the criminal justice system. Are there any more questions? And if there aren't, uh, maybe the panel has some final comments. Um, I think this has been a very instructive afternoon. Um, a lot of new insights. 
uh, especially on the importance of strategic litigation. Um, something that we really need to work on. Uh, and um, we, what can I say? I think the funding part is crucial. Um, and we have some problems there. Um, the movement as a whole, but um, our project as well. Uh, and we need to really work on that and to find the good cases. Um, yes, and to develop uh, practices and spread knowledge about this to increase the um, the um, opportunities and the interest of others to participate. Don't know how to end, but I think <laughs> perhaps I can say I think it's very important that we cooperate, cooperate and, and learn from each other. We are working here in Sweden. What worked, what did not work, and how could we receive a change and so on. So I think it's, uh, this meeting is the first meeting, um, and I think just to continue to cooperate. <coughs> but I also think that there was a question before um, on how we can ensure that the CRPD will be used in the Swedish litigation. Um, and from the civil rights defenders' point of view, um, we use the European Convention on Human Rights as long as possible, because it's national law, it's a human right law, and it covers at least half of the CRPD rights. And it has the European Court of Human Rights, which also can be useful. So I think that is one way. May I just uh, and there I might just add that uh, our project uses the CRPD in court uh, with the help of the European Convention as well and the Swedish law. And actually right now we are together with Stella here uh, taking a case to court uh, about the right to choose where you want to live using Swedish leg legislation, European Convention and the CRPD trying to uh, get the court to actually interpret Swedish legislation and the European Convention in the light of the CRPD. Yeah, um, being Swedish and quite bored with, with the Swedish system, uh, I'm going to um, say that we have some major challenges um, in front of us and we have today here talked about some of the things that is, is joint challenges, but also you in America has come quite far from us. In Sweden we have um, basically a um, misunderstanding that the government is good and that discrimination is bad. Uh, and while discrimination is bad for a Swede, it means that a uh, Swede doesn't necessarily want to kind of acknowledge that it exists. Uh, so we have limited resources, very limited resources. And there's a huge task ahead, not just to find cases and, and litigate, uh, but also to make disabled people understand what discrimination is and how it works and how to report uh, cases into us. While it is important with education and with knowledge dissemination, I would hate for these projects to be yet another project or projects that goes towards educated non-disabled professionals. And I'm, I'm saying this because I've seen it over and over and over again. I want these projects to find disabled people who have been discriminated against and sue the ass of people. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us. I've learned an awful lot about your situation and what your challenges and struggles are and 
We certainly have ours in the United States. I, I mean, if you go to New York, the largest city in the United States, you will find so many challenges, both in terms of awareness, attitudes, and physical barriers. Uh, it's, it's really quite astonishing. So although we seem like we're so far ahead, and yes, we are maybe on our philanthropic <laughs> ways and all of that, um, and in the laws, uh, we can learn from you as well, and hopefully we've been helpful some way, and we love to continue the dialogue, and we're always available by email back and forth, so and thank you. And in the summertime. And in the summertime, <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> thank you. This is, it, I can't begin to tell you how energizing this is for us, and we look forward to the next time. Thanks.